raised up from the dead, led captive and he captive, it is finished, oh he gave us the keys, his authority, and now we are joined. joined us. Why don't you stand and sing with us?
Let's go! Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Good morning, Emmanuel. We are so glad you're here. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Amen. Psalm 126. Yes, I love it. Let's go again. The joy of the Lord, the Psalm 126 verse says, the Lord has done great things for us. Listen, we are filled with joy. Again, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy of the Lord. Are you grateful? As we are here in the presence of God, we will be filled with the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's have a greeting time. Find three people around you who you do not know. Maybe no name you don't know. Tell them you will be filled with joy. You ready? You ready? Let's go. <clears throat> Great stuff, man.
Emmanuel, at this moment, we are preparing to receive communion together. Each corner of the worship center, you can find where the closest communion station is for you so that you can have bread and cup. I also want you to know gluten-free bread is also available in front, st front stations. If you want our usher to get the element for you, please raise your hands. We would be happy to serve you. After having back your seat with the element, I will lead you to partake of the element together. So you may get the element now. When I was 13 or 14 years old in Korea, my family visited grandfather's house during a big holiday like a Korean Thanksgiving. When we were eating together with many relatives, my place to sit at the table would indicate my status and how our family think of me. However, I was never allowed to sit at the fancy table where my grandparents, father, and uncle sat around, where the best foods are prepared, while my older brother was always allowed to sit with them. Instead, I always had to sit at the separate table with no chair, meaning I had to sit on the floor to eat. I was at the small table with my cousin who were five or six years younger than me because I had to babysit. My big, big brother was sitting in a chair while I was sitting on the floor in the corner every single holiday. I still remember how much I hated the seat to eat those childish young cousins. Sitting at a small table made me feel like I'm not good enough. After I became a believer in Jesus, I read a story about Jesus eating with the tax collector and sinner, the word despised in the Gospels. Since then, every time I took communion, I have known that, that I am invited the table of king of kings, Amen. and that I'm loved enough 
by Jesus to eat with him. No matter what other or myself tells me that I'm not good enough. Here's a question for you. Have you, how have you been seeing yourself this week? How do you think the people around you are thinking of you? Have you been comparing yourself to those around you? If you have felt like you are not good enough, remember, today, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Creator and Savior, is inviting all of you to His table, this communion, because you are deeply, deeply loved. Enough to receive his love. Amen. Amen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Jesus shed his innocent blood on the cross to free us from any condemnation of sins. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and thanks for. Let's keep worshiping. Would you stand, please?
Good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church today. We are so glad that you have joined us, whether you've joined us in person or online. Thank you for being here. And if you are here, please check in. Go to the Church Center app. If you don't have it, download it and go to the check-in tab and let us know that you're here, who you're with, what time you're watching, all the important stuff. Just go and check in right now. It's super easy. Our starting point class starts today during second service and you're thinking, what is that? Starting point is for anybody who is new or newer to Emmanuel who wants to get to know what our church is all about and it's not too late to join. You can go to the groups tab today or just go into the cafe during second service and be a part of Starting Point. It is a great class to get to know new people, to get to know Emmanuel Church, and just to really grow in who you are and your understanding of a lot of different things. So if you're still interested, you can still be a part of it today. And if you plan on going, again, it is today, second service in the cafe. If you are still interested in joining but can't make it today, you can still come next week and be a part of Starting Point for the rest of the weeks, which it's a four week class. So you can still come next week and join then as well. The Fall Family Flannel Fest is coming up soon. Next Sunday will be the last day to sign up to be a part of it. And then the event will be a week after that on October 20th. It is gonna be such a fun event after church. We are gonna have chili made by you. That's right, a chili cook-off and we will supply hot dogs and chips and drinks and all types of stuff. We'll also supply the fun. There's gonna be tons of activities to do with your family, with other families. We would really love for you to be here. So make sure you sign up your family this week to be a part of the fun. Just be here for it because you're gonna to wanna to be a part of it. We are within a month of three services. Isn't that crazy? Do you remember? It just felt like yesterday when Mark announced it this summer and now it's almost here. Just a reminder, the new service times are gonna be 8.30, 10, and 11.30. And also to our online community, we will be streaming our service live at 10 a.m., not nine. So it's gonna be a little bit different. We're giving you an extra hour of sleep and that day happens to be daylight saving. So you're getting two extra hours of sleep on November 3rd, you're welcome. Just no need to thank us, okay? But on November 3rd, the times will be changing as will the live stream time again. So make sure you're ready for that. Make sure you know your plan for that day. Don't be the person that shows up at the wrong time. I'm gonna remind you every single Sunday from now until then, November 3rd, 8.30, 10, 11.30, and our live stream is gonna happen at 10 a.m. So remember it, get excited for it. It's gonna be an amazing time as God is growing our church in this season. If you are not a part of a group yet, my question is, why not? There are so many groups that you can get connected with this fall here at Emmanuel, and we have a whole bunch of new groups starting up on November 3rd, that's right, the same day as three service day. So we encourage you to go to the groups tab to look into some of the groups that you could be a part of and to join one and to join a community, part of a community here at Emmanuel. Small groups are really a great way to get connected with the people here at Emmanuel. We got some pretty great people. So I encourage you to go check out the groups tab, find a group that you think could be comfortable and fit for you and join. Emmanuel, if there's anything you want more information on, you should pick up a bulletin or go online to our homepage where there's an online bulletin available there. Also, Emmanuel, if you'd like to give today, there are multiple ways you can do that. You can go online to landsell.church slash give. You can go to the Church Center app. There's a give tab there. Or if you're here with us in person, there are giving receptacles by each door to the worship center and one out in the lobby as well. Thank you, Emmanuel, for being here today, for being a part of church. We are glad that you are a part of our church and we're glad that you're here. So let's continue with service. Good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church today. We are so glad that you have joined us, whether you've joined us in person or online. Thank you. And that day happens to be daylight saving person that shows up at the wrong time. I'm going to remind you every single Sunday from now until then. Well, obviously, we have no idea what, what's going on. So there was a bumper for the Juicy Fruit series, which we're starting today, and there was a, just a little bit of a glitch. Um, how many of you have a juicy fruit gum? Now, my mom told me when I was a kid, you're never to chew gum in church, but I'm giving a special dispensation during this season. If you would like to chew a piece of juicy fruit gum while we're in this series, that's totally fine with me. 
couple thoughts about this series. In the next few moments, I'm going to be kind of giving some overall introductory thoughts about the fruit of the Spirit, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the first fruit of the Spirit that is today, and that is joy. And there's a reason why I'm not going to talk about love first. We're going to wait till the end of the series. So let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit for a moment as a way to introduce to the whole series. Notice it's fruit, not fruits. So what does that mean? It's generally thought in scholarly circles that there's one fruit of the Spirit, many different expressions. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. The rest are aspects of love. So, for example, joy is love rejoicing, peace is love at rest, patience is love waiting, kindness is love interacting, goodness is love initiating, faithfulness is love keeping its word, gentleness is love empathizing, and self-control is love resisting temptation. So that's one way to take a look at the fruit of the Spirit. That's why we call it fruit, not fruits. The other way to look at it is to consider that because Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches, the fruit of the Spirit is really a cluster fruit, like grapes. So there's many different grapes, but it's one vine. Now, how many of you love grapes? Can I see your hands? Oh, good. Here you go. You got one? Somebody in the back has to love it. You're getting a twofer. You get it? All right, listen. I got to save enough for the second service. One more. Okay. Oh, I'm way off. I'm really sorry, Russell. Okay. You got it. Okay. So the fruit of the Spirit is really a cluster fruit. All different aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now here's what you need to know about the fruit of the Spirit. If you know Jesus, you already have all of the fruit of the Spirit inside of you. It's not a matter of you getting something that you don't have, it's a matter of cooperating with the Holy Spirit to grow something that's already inside of you. You may not feel like a very patient person. That's okay, patience is in there. It's in you. You just need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to have the Holy Spirit grow that inside of you. One other thought about the fruit of the Spirit as it relates to mental health issues. There's probably, if if you struggle with mental health issues, many of us may do that, may may experience that. Some of you may be on medication for depression or anxiety. You may feel stressed out. You may have social anxiety disorder. You know, whatever mental health issues we bring to the table, it's a challenge when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit because we say, yeah, that's for everybody else. I don't feel any joy. I don't feel any peace. Here's what you need to know about the fruit of the Spirit. It's like the sun. The sun is always shining. But there are cloudy days or cloudy seasons in which we don't see the sun, we don't feel the sun, but we know that the sun is there. And then there are moments of our lives in which the clouds part and we actually see the sun. It's like that with the fruit of the Spirit. If you are struggling with anxiety or depression or any other mental health issue, all of the fruit are already inside of you, though the anxiety acts as a cloud. So your job, my job, is to actually figure out When the Bible talks about joy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, what does that mean? Is joy a feeling or is it something else? So I want to give a lot of hope 
for people. This series is for you if you struggle with mental health issues because you can experience all the fruit of the Spirit. You may need to rewire your understanding of what the Bible says about each fruit of the Spirit. So you ready? Let's go ahead and begin. Today I want to talk about joy. So when did we get so serious? Some of you are thinking, well, we're living in serious times. Have you seen the latest death toll from Hurricane Helene? 227. Do you know that there is an expanding war taking place in the Mideast? Um, we're still in a huge conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Many Americans are thinking that we're going in the wrong direction. In fact, I think the latest poll says 76% of all Americans think we're going in the wrong direction. Inflation has caused great damage. The national debt continues to skyrocket, threatening to cripple the next generation. This summer was the hottest day on record, was recorded on July 22nd. Holly and I celebrated a milestone anniversary, so we took a cruise, a Mediterranean cruise, and the day after, the hottest day of the year, we were in Athens, and it was 104, but it was 112 the day before. And Holly looked at me and said, you are never planning a cruise again. <laughs> if this is your idea of having a good time, we just melted. It was so hot. But still, when did we get so serious? Because there's always been wars. There's always been national disasters. So I was talking to my sister the other day, and she said to me, do you remember duck and cover? Look, some of you are like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And others of you, you're old. <laughs> so <clears throat> when I was a kid growing up, we had duck and cover drills. So we lived, we grew up in Schenectady, New York, outside of Albany, the capital, and we lived on, in a, on, we lived on Westcott Road, mom, dad, sister, and I, and we were about a mile away from an army depot, one of the largest in, in the Northeast. And we were always told that if there was a nuclear attack, we'd be on the, the A list because we lived near an army depot. So we grew up with drills of getting underneath our desks, practicing if there was a nuclear attack. Of course, it was years later before we realized if it's a nuclear attack, being underneath your desk means nothing. Right? But here's the thing. Having regular duck and cover drills, knowing that at any moment, because when I was a kid, it was the height of the Cold War, it didn't stop me and my friends from leaving school, going out and riding bikes until dusk, or playing baseball until dusk. We had a blast growing up. I loved my childhood growing up, and yet we lived under this constant threat of nuclear war. Now, all this brings me down to a simple point. As Christians in the world, we're supposed to be living differently. Sometimes we don't. That's a whole other story. But we're supposed to live differently. I think we should resurrect a word that nobody uses anymore, and that is the word winsome. Winsome is someone who has an attractive quality about themselves that draws you to them. You ever heard about somebody who has a winsome personality? And there's just something about them that is attractive to them. The Apostle Paul wrote an entire letter to a small house church in Philippi. He doesn't use the word winsome, he uses the word joy. And in these 
This little letter that he wrote, he uses the word joy 19 times. That is the theme of the letter to the Philippians, joy. So this morning, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 4 through 9. Now, I'm not going to read all, all five verses, six verses. I am going to read the first couple verses, though, and then make comment in the rest of the message on the other verses. So verses 4 and 5 of Philippians 4 says these words. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let, everybody who, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. So always be full of joy. Not sometimes, not 50%, always. So my question to you is, Zero to 10, where are you at with joy today? Are you a two, a five, a seven? And then the next question would be, what would it take in this series, but particularly today we're talking about joy, what would it take to move from a four to a seven? Or from a five to a nine in joy? So let me ask and answer a couple questions. First of all, what robs you and me of joy? Two things. The first is comparison. We say this a lot around here. I love Teddy Roosevelt. If you've ever been to Oyster Bay and seen his estate on Long Island, it's well worth going. But he has this phrase, right? Comparison is the thief of joy. So here, here's what comparison does. Comparison does this. Did you see the car they just got? Did you see the vacation they went on? Did you see their family? Did you see the house they got? Did you see he just got his PhD? Did you know he just got a big raise? And we keep going back and forth, and we compare ourselves to other people, and that becomes the thief of contentment because all comparison is rooted in discontentment. The answer to the comparison trap that steals our joy is just a few verses later in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, I have learned how to be content whatever I have. Now, I love this, this sentence because it gives me a little bit of hope here because you have to learn contentment. You, you just have to learn it. And it's going to be a slow going. There are seasons in your life in which you'll be doing well with not being discontent, and then there'll be other seasons in which you'll be doing really badly with it. And you'll have to keep recentering yourself and coming back saying, oh, right, right, right. I have to learn contentment. John Stuart Mills is, was a philosopher, and he said these words. I have learned to seek my happiness by limiting my desires rather than attempting to satisfy them. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. I know we're living in an age where it just says, be your best self. And you know, I think you should be your best self. But I also think we're living in an age where it's just more and more and more when we actually should learn to limit our desires so that we're content with what we have. Because if we're always looking at the more, 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 we'll never be satisfied. There's a second thing that robs us of our joy, and that is worry. Verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Corey Ten Boom, who's a World War II concentration camp survivor, she was a wonderful Christian. Holly and I have been to her house in Harlem, Holland. We actually bought a clock. Her, her, her dad was a clockmaker. And they hid Jews in World War II. And they hid Jews behind a false wall. And you can go there today because it's now a museum, and you can stand in the false wall and, and just stand there. And they would line up. When the Germans would come, they'd, they'd just line up everybody, six, seven, eight people at a time, and sometimes they'd have to be there for 24, 48 hours. But it was better than going into a concentration camp. Well, they were caught, and she and her sister Betsy went to a concentration camp, and Betsy died there. Corey survived and went on to minister all throughout post-World War II Europe and led crusades, and led a lot of people to Christ. She said this about worry. Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength, carrying two days at once. That's what worry is. It's carrying two days 
rather than the one day you're given. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its strength. Worry sucks joy from us. So here's my question. How, how do we actually get more joy? So this is miracle grow. You know what miracle grow is? Right? You, you sprinkle a little miracle grow either on the ground or you put it in some water, concentrated, and then you water your plants, and suddenly that rhododendron that was looking pretty terrible just kind of, poof, right? And it gets nice. Here's what's interesting. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, the apostle Paul says, don't worry about anything. And 19 times he says, you should be full of joy. And the, and the church in Philippi must have been scratching their head thinking, I get that but I don't know how to get that. And the Apostle Paul, in these next five verses, sprinkles a little miracle grow on the church in Philippi and says, let me give you five ways that you can grow more joy in your life through the Holy Spirit. And here they are. First of all, we ought to pray about everything. Verse 6, instead, pray about everything. Do not worry, right? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Now, the key word here is not prayer. It's everything. Most of us pray, I think. Right? But we should be praying about everything. The big things as well as the little things. You know who needs prayer right now? The Phillies. We should call a prayer meeting at 3.08, an hour before. But I sense that there's disunity over here at the church right here because somebody showed up with the Mets apparel, right? We'll pray for you. But seriously, if it concerns you, it concerns God. Here's the thing that I have learned. You cannot worry and pray at the same time. You can worry or you can pray. You cannot worry and pray. And so the more you end up praying about the little things in your life that you don't think, I don't want to bother God with them, God says, no, 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 no. You come bother me because I love you. My two grandsons come to me all the time asking for little things. Pop up, I need more batteries. Okay. I mean, it, the list is endless. I never mind it because they're my grandchildren and I love them. And it's not a bother. Okay, sometimes it is. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Because here's what happens. When you pray about even the little things and when you see that most of your little things actually work out, this gives you an opportunity to go, oh, I was worrying for nothing. Because 92% of what you worry about never happens anyway. That's a secular study. That's not a Christian study. 92% of what you and I worry about never comes to fruition. It's just here in our mind. So pray about everything. Make your prayer list really long. Because if it matters to you, it matters to God. Secondly, be thankful. Thank him for all that he's done. Gratitude and joy always go together. So, I don't want to freak you out. I'm going to put a pause on the message right now. And I want you to think about five things you're thankful for. Just five. And we're going to pause. If you're watching online, do the same exact thing. We're just going to pause the message right now. Think about five things, and would you just express your gratitude to God for those five things. You ready? Go. I'll call you back. In Jesus' name, amen. You, you know what just happened? You went way beyond five, didn't you? I mean, I listed off my five and said, oh, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, oh yeah. Now, here's what will happen. There may be lots of bad things going on in your life right now. That doesn't mean you should stop being thankful. Because if you elevate the things that you're thankful for, it'll change your perspective and joy will start coming back into your heart. And you go, All right, okay, it's not as bad as what I thought. Three, focus your thoughts. Verse eight says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure, and the list goes on. <clears throat> So you know, most of you know what's going on in our home. We're in a unique season. Our daughter and her family has been living with us for a number of months. And then they went home for a month. And then she had a relapse and her cancer came back. And they moved in immediately in our house. And so we're, we're back to cancer treatments. Very serious. The truth is, I'm heartbroken. And yet I still have joy. I cannot explain that. I still have joy in my spirit, even though dad's heartbroken. How does that work? Let me tell you what it looks like in my life. For the last year, I have been going to bed with earplugs. Earbuds, not earplugs, earbuds. And every night I listen to a little 10 minute devotional called Lectio 365. It's up on the screen. You can download it. There's a, there's a 10 minute devotional in the morning, there's a 10 minute devotional in the evening. And I go to bed listening to Lectio 365 because it's scripture, it's a little devotional. I don't have to think. And then after that, if I don't drift off to sleep, I can't tell you how many times I woke up at 2 in the morning and my phone is laying on my chest. And my earbuds, you know, my, my earbuds are in there. I'm like, what is happening here? Right? If, if I don't drift off to sleep listening to Lectio 365, I go to another app that I listen to every day. It's called The Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel. They're, they're the creators of the Alpha Course, which we've used here. And you can download that as well. And that's a 22 to 24 minute devotional, readings from the Psalms, reading from the Old Testament, reading from the New Testament. And invariably, if Lectio doesn't put me to sleep, Nikki and Pippa will. <laughs> I once had somebody, you remember cassette tapes? Come on. I once had somebody said to me, Pastor, when I can't go to sleep, I just put a cassette tape of your messages on. <laughs> and I'm out. Right? Well, I took that as a compliment. Okay? Because listen, listen. If I don't do that, my mind goes to dark places. You know what I mean by that? I, I have to intentionally fix my thoughts these days. Because if, if I'm left up to me, they go to dark places. That's what it means to fix your thoughts. It's not complicated. I don't know how you fix your thoughts. Maybe it's going out for a walk. Maybe it's just putting your earbuds on and just um, you know listening to Scripture. But you've got to be able to take a direction that you would typically go because of the stress and anxiety in your life, and you've got to be able to reframe it and send your mind in another direction. That's what it means to fix your thoughts. Number four, keep at it. Verse 9, keep putting into practice all you have learned. The great theologian Taylor Swift said, I have, I have to practice to be good at guitar. I have to write 100 songs before you write the first good one. <clears throat> sanctification, sanctification is what God does in you. Justification is what God does for you. God declares you not guilty when you invited Christ into your life. It's a, it's a law term, right? But sanctification is what God does in you. And sanctification is a process as well as a gift. 
And so this process is you just have to keep at it. You, can't, you need to have your devotions even when you think you're not doing any good. You need to pray even though you keep saying to yourself, I, I don't know, I don't even know how to pray. But you just keep at it. You have to keep fixing your thoughts. You have to keep doing things that you know are going to bring you life, whether in the moment they feel life-giving to you or not. Number five, make sure you have a real relationship with Jesus. Always be full of joy in the Lord. If it's not in the Lord, it's popular psychology. If it's not in the Lord, it's just positive thinking. I'm going to talk next week about peace. And Jesus says something very interesting to his disciples on Resurrection Day. He says to them, peace I give you, not as the world does. And I got thinking, <clears throat> what does that even mean? Not that the world does. And then it occurred to me. The world always has an answer to the gifts of the Spirit, but they're only on a surface level. In other words, the world says, here's how you get joy. You go out and you buy what you want to buy. You do whatever you want to do. Here's how you get peace. You do it this way and you do it this way. And you know what? It's called situational. You may have situational joy. You may have situational peace, but it's not true, deep, down, on the inside kind of peace that gets you through tragedy and crisis. Here's what you need to know. I've gone the entire message and not even given you the definition of peace or joy. And here it is. The biblical definition of joy is not a feeling, it's a focus. The biblical, when the Bible talks about joy, here's where it lands. Joy is contentment and hope in Jesus Christ, that he loves you, that he's with you, that he will never abandon you, that he walks beside you in every single situation. Joy is not what you feel when you get over a bad season of your life. Joy is this attitude, this focus of your mind that says, whether I have a good day or a bad day, going through a good season or a bad season, I know that Jesus loves me and has promised to walk with me no matter what. And that's what joy is. Joy is not a feeling. That's happiness. There's nothing wrong with happiness. Happiness is good. I hope you're all happy. But that's not joy. Joy is this sense of inner contentment that says, Jesus is my rock. And, and if life is good, praise God, and if life isn't good, okay, praise God. If I get my answers to my prayer, praise God. If I don't get my answers to the prayer, I'll live in mystery. But God is still good. That's joy. Now, my question to you is this. Do you know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? No Jesus, no joy. No Jesus, no joy. I quote C.S. Lewis fairly frequently. I just, I just love C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis said these, this term. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Remember what I asked you earlier? Have you gotten too serious? I don't think we're serious enough when it comes to joy. Joy is the serious business of heaven. And it starts with Jesus. Now Listen. I'm going to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your life. Don't complicate it. Don't confuse it. Don't make it bigger than what it is. Do you, have a, do you have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you ever come to the place of saying, Jesus, I invite you to come into my life? If you haven't, this is your moment. Here's what I want to say to you. You cannot earn God's approval. You can't earn it. God's gift to you is salvation. Key word is gift. You, you can't impress God into forgiving you of your sins. It's a free gift. 
Salvation doesn't come by going through catechism. I'm not saying anything negative about catechism. I'm just saying those are rote disciplines that the church has put into place to draw you to Christ. I'm simply asking you, do you have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ? Church attendance doesn't get you into heaven. Being as good enough person as you can doesn't get you into heaven. Salvation is a free gift. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is to just go, I accept. And so if the timing is right for you today, whatever background you've come with, maybe you've come from a church background, maybe you haven't. Maybe this is the first church you've ever really engaged in and you're like, I'm just trying to figure it out. Totally get it. Everything we do here points to Jesus Christ because he's the answer to everything. And when you invite Jesus into your life, that's not the end, that's the beginning of a whole new life. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads where you're at. Close your eyes and ask yourself this question. Do I really know Jesus in a meaningful way? Yes or no? Not hope to, wish I did, just yes or no. And if you don't know or know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this is your moment. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. Just, just say it right there. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I accept your death on the cross, your blood that was shed on the cross as forgiveness of my sins. I invite you to come into my life now and forgive me of every sin I've ever committed, even up till a half an hour ago. Just come into my life. And from this moment on, to the best of my ability, I'm going to be your follower. I don't really know what that means. I'm probably going to make a lot of mistakes. But I accept your free gift of salvation into my life right now. Okay, now listen. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm just going to ask you to stand right where you're at. And the reason why I'm going to ask you to stand where you're at is because I want to pray a blessing over you. This is not to embarrass you. It is to say sometimes we just need an anchor of what we did in our hearts to make it real for us so that on Monday morning, when you go to work or whatever you do on Monday morning, you'll say, you know what? I stood and invited Christ into my life. And that's all I'm going to ask you to do. Just stand. I'll acknowledge you, and you can be seated. That's it. Yep, 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 okay, yeah. Look, all over the room, people are standing to receive Christ. Yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> this is the beginning of joy. Not a feeling, a contentment in your spirit and a hope that Jesus is with you. And he's always going to be with you. Everybody else stand, would you please? Jesus, we need more joy. And we realize that it's a gift from you. So if somebody came in here today with a two or a three, help them to see that they could grow to a seven or an eight if they cooperated with the miracle grow stuff that the Apostle Paul gave this church in Philippi. For those that have received Christ today for the first time, all of heaven rejoices because a lost sheep has come home. And we praise you for that. Holy Spirit, pour a blessing out on the Emmanuel family today that we may be winsome as we go through our week, people being attracted to us 
not because we're personally attractive, but because Jesus is seen in us. Help us to experience that winsomeness this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.
our heads to God. Let me see your face. When I see your face, I see joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is so good, and God loves you so much, and, and, and God is doing amazing things through you. Amen. Amen. Uh, I have an announcement. We have a new here station. If you are a new visitor, please, I recommend you to stop by there. We have a big gift for, for you, Father. Let's pray together. Father, your Holy Spirit is evident here. As I see people's face, your joy, I'm not talking about the feeling, but we decide to focus on you, the perspective change, Father. Holy Spirit, come. Would you let us bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit every single day? Holy Spirit, remind us what we heard through your servant of God so that we can live as your follower of Jesus Christ. We love you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are so glad you're here. Have a great week. Why is it mad? Good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>